All right, everyone awake enough to get started? We'll get started anyway. Yeah, I hope you've all recovered from our little snowstorm. So, uh, announcements. Uh, one important one is I, I sat down with a calendar and started calculating backwards to see when we need to get the next cross started. So you're not through counting F2s yet, right? So we're going to have a little bit of overlap because what I want to be able to do is have you guys do that business. You remember collecting virgins? That was an annoying step. I want you to be able to do that the week before spring break. And then you can just set it aside and forget about it while you're sunning on a beach somewhere or whatever you're going to do. And then when you come back, you'll have bottles full of flies to count. That's the plan. Uh, to do that, that means the Thursday labs have to set up that cross tomorrow. So if you're in the Thursday labs, do come by. We'll, we, we just got to throw some flies in a bottle so we can get some white miniature forked and wild type flies growing. And then the Tuesday lab will be fine if we start on Tuesday. So we'll get all that started in this little block here. Okay, now the agenda for this week. You can see right there, we're, we're talking about chapter 7. Next week I want to go back to chapter 5. So that one's on linkage, general linkage. Today we're going to talk about sex linkage. I'm going to assign you a bunch more problems for the weekend that are all about sex linkage. And then Monday, we're going to go through and work on problems in class. Because next Friday is when the next take-home exam is due. So let's make sure everyone can solve these problems by Monday. And uh, then maybe by Wednesday, I'll move on to Chapter 5. We'll see. We'll work it out. Okay, so where we were. So on uh, Monday... We were talking about sex determination, how you specify male and female and all these things. Uh, and we're going through all these various permutations of the problem. Uh, the bottom line was that it's really complicated. That we have a history of defining sex entirely by chromosomes, which is invalid and not complete. But it was a nice simple thing. Yeah, it was good enough for 1910, all right? But not good enough for now. So we got a lot more details, a lot more complications that go on in the specification of sex. And we can have more complex processes that interleave various things. And yeah, you can get people who have one sexual orientation at one level of, say, psychology or uh, hormones, but a different level at chromosomes and things like that. So we'll, we'll set that aside for now. It's just messy. So where we were is we were also talking about this, about sex ratios. So sex ratios are, uh, some of them are difficult to determine. So the primary sex ratio is the number of males compared to the number of females conceived. And it turns out that in humans, this ranges from about 1.2 to 1.6. The difficulty in determining that is because, yeah, you get a lot of spontaneous abortions and things like that, and they're, they're, they're also a mess. Um, also, many people would rather you didn't poke around in the remains of their deceased fetus, etc. Uh, it makes it hard to estimate this, but that's that's a reasonable estimate. It's basically saying that there's a lot more boys conceived than girls. The secondary sex ratio is pretty easy to calculate. That the secondary sex ratio is the ratio at birth. So we just count the number of baby girls born, the number of baby boys born, and what you get in the U.S. is a ratio of about 1.05. So still, more boys are born than girls. What happened to this class? Where did all the boys go? 
Yeah, clearly there's other factors that also affect things. Uh, as I mentioned here, some species have very skewed sex ratios. Look at that, there's this butterfly. It's got a sex ratio of 0 0.03. Yeah, so the males there, there's very few males. I guess all the males get lucky. And there's hundreds of females. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a system that works. In fact, females tend to be more important in replenishing a population because you figure a male can fertilize a great many females, but each female has got a limited number of eggs or babies that they can produce. So, this, however, gives the lie to what I explained at the beginning of the last lecture that it sure looks like you could explain the sex ratio with a, as a simple Mendelian trait, right? Big A, little a, a heterozygote crosses to little a, little a, you get 50% big A, little a, and 50% little a, little a. Sounds nice, it doesn't work. Um, again, we keep seeing that it's much more complicated than the simple explanations can tell us. So, it's obviously not going to work, and there's all kinds of factors that can affect the sex ratio. Here's one. So uh, you, if you look at the statistics from India, this is not to pick on India. Lots of countries have this issue. It actually may be a smaller but real problem in the United States. And that is, all too often, uh, couples may prefer boy babies to girl babies. And if you've got access to um, ultrasound, if you've got amniocentesis, all these sorts of things, you, know, you can determine the sex before the baby is born. And uh, some people will then scamper off to get an elective abortion. And we're seeing the effects of that in India. So as you can see, the proportion of female babies is dropping over the years as this occurs. I am not going to make a moral judgment on that. But it, it, it does mean that there's a, maybe a problem here. Yes? Is that due to like overpopulation there? Because like China's having that issue because of their one baby policy, right? Yes. It's, well, is it, is it, can we really blame it on overpopulation? Because it's more, it's more a cultural preference for boys. Okay. And even if they weren't overpopulated, you might have this problem. In the United States, for instance, there is also a cultural preference for boys over girls. Uh, but it, we're, kind of, we're kind of balancing that with a Christian in, antipathy to abortion. So, yeah. These are complicated social issues. That's where I want to leave it at, because uh, we're talking genetics. Okay, there's another ratio, the tertiary sex ratio, and that's the ratio of the number of males to females at sexual maturity, and it is almost perfectly 1.0 here. Remember, there's about 5% more boys born than girls, but then by the time they hit 16 to 20 years old, it's now down to a ratio of 1.0, and it's because males are more prone to heritable diseases. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to encourage boys to engage in more risky behaviors. So there's going to be an attrition of males over that period of time. But the point is, it's not a simple Mendelian thing. It's not X, Y, and X, X come together, you get 50% boys and 50% girls. You clearly don't. So there's other things that are influencing this. Uh, this is uh, Fesh Fisher's explanation for why we get that nice, tidy one-to-one -one at sexual maturity. So this is Fisher over there. Fisher's a very interesting guy. Uh, who's, who's heard of him before? You take him population genetics... But did they mention Fisher there? Oh man, Fisher's a big name in population genetics. 
So he's a major founder of that. He's a statistician. He knows, he's a smart mathematician. Uh, he's also a horrible human being who favored eugenics and uh, sided with Hitler in World War II. So, yeah, people are complicated too, aren't they? Anyway, so Fisher's explanation, here it is. So he says, all offspring have one male parent and one female parent. So that's, that's a boundary condition. Because of the way diploid sexual reproduction works, in most cases, you want equal numbers of males and females. However, males are rare. Something influences the frequency of males. Some, you know, there's a disease that kills just men that sweeps through the population, anything like that. Uh, then what will happen is that the surviving males will have a higher fitness relative to females. And what that means is, okay, well, in that case, so for instance, I might want grandchildren, and if there's a thousand females to every male, uh, my best chance of having grandchildren is if I have a boy baby, right? Because they're pretty much guaranteed to be able to reproduce, uh, but females will have to have more competition. So what that means is surviving males will contribute more of the genes to the next generation. So that'd be a selective favoring of individuals who produce boy babies in that population. And the same is in reverse, if females are rare. A disease sweeps through and kills all the, all the girls in the world, except for a few, then those girls will be the ones to found the next generation. So there seems to become some kind of an evolutionary explanation for this. Of course, in order for this to work, there have to be factors that influence which sex is most likely to be born in the next generation. And that seems to be the case. So I'll mention one here. I mentioned a few on Monday, but here's another one. Uh, this is something called sex chromosome drive. It's also called meiotic drive. Uh, this was studied by this guy over here, who I have to mention. Larry Sadler was my genetics professor back when I was your age. So long, long ago, I know. Uh, he's, he was a brilliant teacher. I'm sorry you don't get to have him. He died in 1987, as you see there. Uh, but yeah, he was really good at this stuff. But his, his specialty, the thing he was most interested in, was this, sex chromosome drive. So here's how to think about that. Imagine there's a gene on the X chromosome that caused any male to carrying it to make defective sperm, but only if the sperm had a Y chromosome. That is, there's a gene sitting on the X chromosome. Remember, every, every male has an X and a Y, and it biases the production of sperm in some way. So that male only produces X-carrying sperm. So all of his children will inherit his X chromosome, not his Y chromosome. He's only going to have daughters, but all of his daughters will carry this particular allele that kills Y-bearing sperm. Okay, so what that would mean is, is this would affect the frequency of these different the different sexes that emerge from this cross. And it's going to spread rapidly. There have been cases where they've observed these. In Drosophila, there are genes that if the if they're found on the X chromosome, that causes the males to only produce X bearing sperm. So they only have daughters. Okay, there's other ways you can do this though. You can imagine there's an X sperm lethal gene on the Y chromosome that guarantees that only the Y chromosome gets passed on. Yeah, so we could do the reverse. If there were a gene on the Y chromosome that kills all the X bearing sperm, then that person will have only boys. And all the boys will obviously carry that trait. Huh. 
I haven't heard of this being observed in humans. But you never know. Uh, this is the tough one, would be a tough one to study because uh, it turns out, as we mentioned just a moment ago, there's a bias in our culture for boy babies. So if some guy is only popping out sons and no daughters, he's not going to go down to the fertility clinic and complain, usually. Okay, another possibility is rather than killing at the sperm level, what if there's a gene on the X chromosome that's expressed in mothers and causes them to spontaneously abort, but only when it's a male fetus? We think we have some cases of that in the human population as well. Uh, remember I told you one of the factors influencing the sex ratio is that uh, eggs are choosy. They can be selective. They can recognize what kind of sperm is coming along and can choose to reject it. They are not passive acceptors of whatever, whatever, males, whatever sperm wins the race. They'll actually balance various factors. So this would just be a variation of that. You can also have mothers who've got uh, eggs that are really choosy and will not allow male sperm to fertilize them. So there's lots of things like this. Here's, here's an easy question. Could we have a Y chromosome gene that skews the sex ratio in mothers? Yeah? Wouldn't it have to be homologous with a part of the X chromosome that is Okay, except mothers don't have a Y chromosome, usually. So this would, this would be a case that's not going to come up very often. Uh, in fact, in this kind of competition for, for genes that select for particular sexes, uh, men are at a disadvantage. Because they can only make a Y-specific trait that's only going to affect sons. But if you have an X-specific trait, it can affect both sons and daughters. Okay, so we've got all these fun things going on. As I said, Larry Sandler is a big name in studying these things. There's another factor going on here. This is something called sexual antagonism. And it's been vividly observed in Drosophila because Drosophila males are real bastards, I'm sorry to say. So Drosophila has this elaborate courtship, right? Seems all cute and charming. The males sing, they do this licking behavior, they taste the female, um, then all that before uh, copulation occurs. But then they have this wicked, wicked thing they do, that Drosophila semen carries various pheromones that affect the female's behavior. So when a male mates with a female, he's basically injecting her with chemicals that cause a bunch of changes in behavior. They get less interested in sex. This is to the male's advantage because he doesn't want anyone else mating with his female, right? So he's going to shut off her sex drive. It also does other cruel things, like it suppresses grooming behavior. So the females don't clean up and polish up so much. Uh, it changes the um, waxes that are expressed on their cuticles. So they suddenly have a different flavor if another male comes along. In addition, the sperm, sperm in flies, they have gigantic long tails that are several body lengths longer. Those coil up and form a plug in the female's reproductive tract. So yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of evil what male flies do to female flies. Basically, when a female fly has sex with a male, she gets all these hormones that tell her to stop taking care of your... You keep doing this to me. Uh, get, all, get all skanky, you know, and don't be interested in sex. And if you are interested in sex, 
uh, you get this big plug sitting in your reproductive tract. It's, it's not nice at all. Okay, obviously it is in the female's interest to oppose this. So female flies have evolved other genes that make them resistant to that behavior. So yeah, you, they get the same hormones from the male, but they're able to suppress the response so they can still have an interest in sex, they can still groom, all this kind of good stuff. So there are ex-associated genes that help resist this effect. There was once this fascinating study by a guy named William Rice. Uh, he did a selection experiment. So what he did is that he selected for Drosophila females that were better able to resist the males. So that would give him a tool to study this. He also selected for males that could then overcome that improved female resistance. So we're getting kind of an arms race. That's why this is called sexual antagonism, is that the females are, being, are trying to be selected for resistance to these drugs from the males. And the males are trying to improve their chemistry to be more potent in suppressing females. So they're just, they're just getting better and better at all of these things. So he selected these for 29 generations. And basically he bred a line of super potent males. Males that could overcome any genetic or chemical be be barrier that the females put up against them. And then he does this experiment where he takes these should we call them super potent males? That's, that's just, that just sounds so flattering. They're, they're just super bad males, really. And so he took some of these super bad males and he's going to breed them to ordinary female fly. You know, like the ones you've got down in the lab. And ask what happens. And what happened was kind of dramatic. When they mated with the females, they dropped in. The females did, because they were loaded with these super pheromones that so thoroughly suppressed the female physiology that they all died, which, which is not adaptive, by the way. Okay, and this is a general fact. Why chromosomes are never found in females? So I told you that the Y chromosomes are kind of a disadvantage for that reason, but it does mean that because they're only found in males, if they acquire genes that are extremely deleterious to females, they can, they can persist if they confer a slight advantage to them. Yeah, okay. Now, by slight advantage to the male, what we mean is simply that that male is more likely to have its offspring passed on to the next generation. Okay, so we got really weird stuff going on here. And you might be saying, well, that's only in flies. It doesn't happen in people. And unfortunately, it does happen in people. Uh, so what's going on here is that we have internal fertilization, and we also maintain our offspring in the female womb. So that's, that sounds like quite a powerful tool that the females is now taking care of everything internally. She ought to be in control. But the interface between the fetus and its mother is a structure I'm sure you've all heard of called the placenta. So we got this placenta there. The placenta is actually fetal tissue. It is not constructed by the mother. So the, the embryo, well actually the embryo is going to be split into embryo and this membranous portion of the, of the embryo, which binds to the uterine wall. It does all this amazing elaborate stuff. It interdigitates uh, loops of blood vessels with mom's blood vessels so that it can suck nutrients out of mom's bloodstream. There's an opportunity here 
because that placenta could be selected for for having male genes. Male genes that uh, then make a decision that baby is more important than mom. So it's in the male's interest, the mother invests as much effort as possible to his progeny. In, in some very narrow evolutionary senses, what this means is that dad should be just fine if that, if his baby sucks everything out of mom. So if you've known pregnant people, you know it's exhausting, right? Because they're, they're, all their resources are being drained to feed this little fetus growing down there. And that's all mediated by the placenta, which has variable kinds of genes that might affect this. So mom, of course, wants to conserve. No mother wants to die in childbirth, right? So it's in the, in, in the interest of the mother to ration her resources to the child. She may want to have children again someday. Dad is thinking, no, he's not thinking. Dad's genes are kind of plotting that, yeah, if we suck mom dry for this baby, we'll just go and get another woman and have another baby. So it's in the female's interest to conserve it's Y associated genes, paternal genes, that are important in regulating the activity of the placenta. So dad's genes are all saying, suck away, just, just grab everything, bring it into the fetus. Mom's genes are saying, hold it, wait a minute, don't get greedy, let's be sensible about this. So there's a little competition going on there. Uh, so in a sense, the placenta is a parasite. It's a parasite living on the female. Okay, we know this because these are common problems in pregnancy. Uh, the placenta is going to induce the production of hormones that trigger increased insulin production. You've heard of gestational diabetes? Yeah, what's going on there? Well, it's not to mom's interest, but if the placenta can trick mom into releasing more sugar into her bloodstream so that the fetus can harvest it. That's nice. Nice for the baby. Uh, also things like elevating blood pressure. The higher mom's blood pressure, the more of that precious fluid is being delivered to the fetus, to the placenta. And of course, maternal genes don't want that. You all want to survive if you're pregnant. So you get these problems. Gestational diabetes, and, and you may have heard of preeclampsia, which can be a life-threatening surge in blood pressure. It makes perfect genetic and evolutionary sense in the same way that uh, male fruit flies suppressing the sexual behavior of their mates makes perfect evolutionary sense. It's still kind of a nasty thing to do. Okay, so it does happen. It's something to watch for. There's, there's evidence that there is a, a genetic basis to things like preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. Another interesting topic to explore at some point. But now we have to switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about this guy. Thomas Hunt Morgan. So if there are two big names in the history of genetics to remember, one is, Tom, is Gregor Mendel, but the other is Thomas Hunt Morgan. Thomas Hunt Morgan took Gregor Mendel's ideas and expanded on them. In particular, he discovered ways in which Gregor Mendel's principles were incorrect, but could be explained by other phenomena that we'll be discussing, discussing here. So he figured out a couple of things. Look at this list. This is an amazing list. So first of all, he's the guy who introduced Drosophila to genetics labs. 
Thomas Hunt Morgan was initially a developmental biologist, an embryologist, yay for developmental biologists, and he studied Drosophila as his experimental animal, studying how this insect develops. And he worked out all these procedures for raising it in the lab. And then he read Mendel's stuff. Oh, and genetics seemed to be really the wave of the future. There's lots of cool stuff in genetics to figure out. And he realized, well, I don't have pea plants, but I have a fly room. And I can raise thousands and thousands of fruit flies even faster than Mendel, Mendel could grow peas. So that's cool. Yeah, he's just going to say, I'm going to do Mendel stuff, but I'm going to do it with fruit flies. And that turned out to be a really fruitful line of research. Okay, the other thing he's going to do is eventually he's going to figure this out. He's going to identify mutations as the source of new alleles. He had to. Remember I told you with Mendel, he would just go down to the local seed store, or he'd get on to a seed catalog, and just order all these varieties. Oh yeah, yellow peas, green peas, purple flowers, white flowers. Uh, he would just order them and get them delivered. With fruit flies, it's a new experimental animal. They didn't have much in the way of variety. All fruit flies look kind of alike. Yeah, we're, you know, we're looking at scarlet and brown-eyed mutants right now. They didn't have those then. It was all new. So he had to figure out how to get varieties. And one of the things he's responsible for, he and a student in particular, a guy named Mueller, worked out methods for generating mutations. They called them sports back then, but yes, it was mutations. So they discovered various ways to use chemicals to induce mutations. They discovered ways to use radiation a little later to induce mutations. So they get all kinds of genetic novelty. Then these two things, this is going to engage us for the next few weeks. So he's going to map out the locations of genes and chromosomes. That's our next cross in the lab, by the way, is we're going to do a mapping cross to figure out where some genes are on the chromosomes. Uh, and he also characterized the pattern of sex-linked inheritance. Again, remember, Mendel, when he did his experiment, he did all those reciprocal crosses. Sex didn't make any difference. But Morgan is going to discover some cases where the sex of the parents does make a difference. And it's going to tell us a lot about how genes are transmitted. Okay, so he's going to figure all these things out. Now, again, to do this, you know, in genetics you need variants. You need different forms, different alleles, so you can do crosses and see results. How can you figure out what's dominant and recessive if every fly is the same, as near as you can tell? So one of his first projects was, okay, let's go look for variants. Let's go look for weird flies. And uh, he did this just by the simple expedient of every day coming in, taking down a bottle of flies, or a couple of bottles of flies, knocking them out, throwing them on the microscope, and then staring fixed it, fixedly at hundreds and hundreds of flies, trying to find the weird ones, trying to find ones that stood out from the rest of the crowd. And early on, he found this one. This is the famous white-eyed fly. So as you can, there's our wild type. You're all familiar with looking at eye color, right? There it is with the dark red eyes. That's what they're supposed to look like. So he's got all these hundreds of flies and he's just sorting through them. And this one would stand out, right? You'd have no problem picking that out from a mass of red-eyed flies. <coughs> so he's got distinctive white eyes, really easy to spot. So he's looking through his hundreds and hundreds of flies and one day, Eureka, aha! He sees this weird looking fly with white eyes. Now there's, there's an opportunity. 
So what does he do? He isolates this fly and uh, sets it aside and he's going to start breeding it with the strongest, healthiest looking red-eyed females. You can find. It's a male, by the way. So he's got this male white-eyed fly. Uh, the story goes that he took this fly home with him so that he could take care of it non-stop. Just keeping an eye on this fly. How come you guys don't show that dedication with your flies? <laughs> well, Thomas Hunt Morgan did. He's taking this fly home. Uh, the uh, thing is, his wife wasn't too happy about it because his wife was pregnant at the time. And he seemed to care more about the health of this little fly than of his pregnant wife. Fortunately, as you know, with flies, it doesn't take long. You got a couple of weeks, and then you're going to have new babies to take care of, and you're going to perpetuate this line. So yeah, he spent a few weeks just nursing this fly. Apparently, it was kind of sickly to begin with. Yeah, how would you know? But anyway, he had to take careful care of this because this was going to be uh, part of his future. All right. So. Let's dissect his experiment. So here we go. These, these are actually Thomas Hunt Morgan's drawings from the paper he published on the subject. Uh, so here's our parentals. Here's that precious white-eyed boy fly that he has brought home. And he's going to mate this with a female fly. What would you, ex so just thinking purely in Mendelian terms, this is, okay, this is a simple cross, one trait. What would you expect the F1s to look like? Oh, the F1s. We're just going to look at the F1s first. Yeah, so the F1s are going to tell us which trait is dominant and which one is recessive. Is red dominant or is white dominant? But we expect all the F1s to look the same. And that's what he got. So in the F1s, the progeny of these two flies, he gets male and female flies, and they all have red eyes. So what does this tell you? Speak up. <laughs> red is that red is dominant to white. Yes. Hey, this is this is looking very Mendelian, isn't it? It all fits. No problem here so far. It's just looking just looking like pea plants. So we determined. Okay, white has to be a recessive allele. So now what he's going to do? Oh, you've done this too. You got these F1s, you just cross the F1s to each other. And then what do you expect? In the F2s, you just told me. The 3 to 1. That's when you expect the 3 to 1. So yes, he's going to cross them, he's going to get a 3 to 1 ratio, that's what he expects. So he's going to see 3 of the dominant phenotype and 1 of the wild type. And you're saying to yourself, this, just, this is just Mendel. There's no surprises here. This is exactly what we'd expect. Except for one thing he noticed. One very peculiar thing. Every single one of the female F2s had red eyes. And all of the white-eyed flies were found in the males. Only males had white eyes. And it was only half of them. Actually, precisely half the males had white eyes and half had red eyes. Huh. How do you interpret that? So we got the 3 to 1 ratio. Looks just like Mendel. But all the females are red-eyed. Half the males are... We got a sex difference. We got to figure out what's going on with this. So again, Mendel did not see sex differences. Didn't matter. But here, we are seeing it. Okay, so here's the, his explanation. So he says, okay, white must be carried on the X chromosome. Because he knew 
from, for instance, Nettie Stevens' work, that flies have, female flies have two X chromosomes, male flies have one X chromosome, and the males also have a Y chromosome. He wasn't certain, certain about Y chromosomes, but he, he knew they didn't seem to do anything. So there's the white, and it must carry, it, the white must be carried on the X chromosome, while the Y chromosome does nothing. It's just got no homologous genes. And then what he inferred is, okay, there are kind of two flavors of the X chromosome. So one kind of X chromosome has the red allele, the red eyes, and the other one carries the white allele, and the Y chromosome is basically empty. Uh, Morgan even just called it the zero chromosome. Big nothing. Okay, that's, that's an interesting hypothesis. So then, if we think about... Now if we think about what genes and chromosomes are inherited in each case. So this is the same cross, but now we're going to focus on this over here. Okay, so we've got a white-eyed male here. He must have an X chromosome carrying the white allele and a Y chromosome that does nothing. That's why he's white-eyed. The females, these are, this is his wild type stock, stock is ordinary female. So uh, the female is going to have two red alleles on her two X chromosomes. All right? Then we cross those, we get our, we get our F1s. Again, this is the same as the previous diagram. And in this case, the male must have inherited the red from mom and got the Y from dad there. And so the males are all carrying one copy of the red allele and a Y chromosome, so they look red. The females, on the other hand, they had to have inherited the white chromosome from dad and the red chromosome from mom. So this is telling us all the females are heterozygous, which again you'd expect from a Mendelian cross, and the males are weird. They've just got the wild type allele on the X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So we can see how all those get passed along after all the arrows are telling us. Now what about the F2s? We're not going to cross this by this. And like we said last time, you get all the females are red-eyed and half the males are white-eyed. What's the genotype of those individuals? Well, here's the list. So, half the females have to be homozygous for red eyes. So they would have inherited this from dad and this one from mom. The other half of the females would be heterozygotes, like this one here. So again, because, because dad only passes along his X chromosome to his daughters and doesn't pass along the Y, so it would have inherited X red. And in this case, it would have also inherited the other white-eyed chromosome from mom. So you get Half the females are homozygous for the wild type, half are heterozygous. But they're all red-eyed, right? What about the males? Well, we look down here and we see, okay, uh, this male had to have inherited the Y from dad. So we can just kind of ignore that. And the males would have inherited either this X chromosome or this one from mom. And if they inherited the red one, they got they got red eyes. If they inherited the white one, they got white eyes. See, it all makes sense. This is this is one of the things that Morgan is going to win the Nobel Prize for. And you probably all say, "Oh yeah, that's that's so easy. I wish I could do that, and get a Nobel Prize." Now he did all the easy stuff first. Although to be honest, 
This took a little bit of insight. It was something you had to think about to come up with the answer for it. Okay, what if we do a reciprocal cross? So, previous cross, we crossed a white-eyed male to a red-eyed homozygous female. And we got the result we just, just described. Let's see, what if we take a red-eyed male and cross it to a white-eyed female? In order for a female to be white-eyed, she has to be homozygous, because it's a recessive allele, remember? So this is our cross here. What will the result of that be? Well, in the next generation, what you'll see is you will get white-eyed males and red-eyed females. 100% of the males are going to be white-eyed. 100% of the females are going to be red-eyed. And also 100% of the females are going to be carriers. They're going to be heterozygous. Okay, again, you can follow the arrows to see where each of these chromosomes came from. But that's our, those are our F1s then. We are, we've got white-eyed white males. Sort of like the previous cross, but we're going to cross those to heterozygous females. We ask, what comes out of that? Well, oh, first of all, yeah, all the males are white-eyed, all the females are red-eyed carriers. And when you cross those to each other, in the F2s, this is what you get. So of the females, half are going to be red-eyed and heterozygous. Half are going to be white-eyed. Of the males, half are going to be red-eyed and half are going to be white-eyed. So we get a different proportion when we switch the, parent, the sex of the parents around. So that's kind of amazing. Mendel never saw anything like this. Morgan did, and he quickly figured out what has to be going on here. Okay. He comes to this really important conclusion. And this was, this was an earth-shaking discovery. This is the big one. Because remember, Mendel was talking about his unit factors. They're all abstract, mathematical and statistical and probabilistic. That's what he knew about them. At the same time Mendel had written his work, people were doing all those cytological experiments and discovering all these different things called chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes in every cell. What Morgan's experiment showed was that one trait, one particular allele, one gene, could be mapped to a single chromosome, in this case the X chromosome. So what he has discovered is a material link between these abstract things like eye color or P color or whatever and specific chromosomes in the cell. That's a very important discovery. Okay, uh, let me see. let me before I go into that next bit. So what this means is now the hunt is on. You found one. You found one gene that's got a specific location on the X chromosome. Now let's go looking for where all the other genes are located. And that's really the subject of chapter five. So I'll hold off on it a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about what you can do with this observation. So I talked to you before about pedigrees. And I told you, well, you know, we've got these conventions for pedigrees. You all remember this. So that's a girl, that's a boy, that's the proband, the person who came in and said there was, a, there was an issue to study. Uh, this is a, a marriage line, so those are related. Uh, this is uh, the sibship line. So this is a brother and a brother. Okay, so we had this kind of convention for pedigrees. What we're going to do is go through the different kinds of pedigrees there are. So here's one. This is, says, what if it's an autosomal dominant? 
So we forget everything I just said about X and Y chromosomes. We're going to set that aside for a minute. We'll come back to it. So it's an it's a autosomal trait. It's on one of the other chromosomes. We're saying it's dominant. So there's what the pedigree of an autosomal dominant trait would look like. Right? So all you need is one copy of the allele and you've got the trait. So in this case, this mother has the trait. Both of her sons have the trait. Okay, both of her sons have it. And her sons then pass it on to the next generation. And uh, there's a couple of things you can see here is, okay, we got girls who have it. We have boys that have it. Uh, here's a boy and a brother and a sister that both have it. And it appears in every generation. So we got a bunch of rules here we can remember. So all affected individuals have at least one affected parent. It's dominant, remember? So where does it come from? It comes from one of your parents. So your parent has a dominant trait, so they'll also express it. Uh, because it's autosomal, it's not a sex-linked gene. Males and females are affected in about equal numbers. Yeah, here you see four and two, but uh, you know, Small numbers, we have to do a lot of numbers to get good statistics on that. Uh, this would also say both males and females transmit it. So here's mom transmitting it to her sons. Here are her sons transmitting it to their children. And here we say mating of a heterozygous affected individual by a normal individual produces approximately half normal and half affected individuals. Again, that's what you see here. So roughly half the children, half the grandchildren in this case, are affected and half are not. Okay, so again, you should be able to spot an autosomal dominant pedigree right away. Key things are, it's affecting both males and females equally. That tells you it's autosomal. And it's appearing in every generation. And every affected individual has an affected parent then you know, okay, that's autosomal dominant. <clears throat> what about autosomal recessive? That's a little trick here. Look over here. This is our affected individual there. Uh, this is saying uh, these, you know, the double line, remember, that shows consanguinity. That means these two are related, as you can see. They are cousins. And they have a child here. Uh, most affected individuals have, individuals have two normal par parents. So you see that there, here's an affected individual, but neither of his parents have it. The way that works is if it's recessive, it must be lurking in the background. It's expressed in both sexes, so there's a boy and there's a girl who got it, and it's transmitted by either sex. We can't see that in this pedigree because the affected individuals haven't had any children yet but that's a general rule. Matings between normal heterozygotes tends to produce significantly more normal than affected progeny. Again, this is a poor example of that, but here we kind of expect these two, they're related. They've got a child who's got this trait. Uh, they're probably both heterozygotes, right? So we expect one quarter of their offspring to express the trait. Also, uh, normal parents of an affected child may be related to one another, that's what we see here. Yeah, so if you're a genetic counselor, that's one of the things you look for in a pedigree. Is there, are there incidences of related people getting married to each other and having children? Because that increases the likelihood of the trait. Uh, then matings between affected and normal individuals usually yields all normal progeny. If it's a rare trait, then the general population at large doesn't have any copies of that weird allele. They are not going to be expressing it. So their offspring will all be normal, but half of them will be carriers. And if you make two affected individuals, again, not shown in this pedigree, if you get two affected individuals, it's recessive. So they got, both got to be homozygous recessive. All of their children will have the trait. 
So these are things you look for. So uh, quick and dirty, you see a ped pedigree like that, I would inst instantly say that's probably autosomal recessive because I got males and females affected and it's skipping generations. Okay. What about Y-link traits? So, what would they look like? Uh, first of all, obviously no female is going to be affected because, well, almost no females will be affected. When we talked last time, there are various situations where some females will have a white chromosome. Uh, but, in general, females are not affected. And, all of the male children with affected fathers express the trait. Every single boy will have that trait because they get their white chromosome from dad and only from dad. And he's only got one. And that white chromosome carries the trait. Uh, there's only two known Y-linked genetic diseases in humans. Remember, Y is it's pretty much empty. And the two diseases are, first of all, maleness. Uh, and the other one, so that one's pretty common, actually. Uh, the other, this is a rare one, hypertrichosis of the ear. I have known a person who had this. It was really interesting. It's more common among certain Jewish populations on the east coast of the U.S. Well, what it means is there's fuzz, you know, more than fuzz, pretty strong hair growth all along the rim of their ear. It actually looks kind of cute. Yeah, I knew this guy. I kind of felt like I wanted to reach out and stroke his ears just to see what it felt like. No, I didn't because that would be crossing boundaries and be very rude. But yeah, he had this nice layer of hair all around there. And this is what the pedigree looks like. So yeah, you see, there's, there's dad. He's got a son and three daughters. None of the daughters have it. They didn't get a Y chromosome from dad. None of the grandchildren, the, the ones produced by the daughters, have it. But his son does. And his son then produces this big family. This, this tends to be found in some certain conservative Jewish families. Uh, they also tend to be very large, which is really handy for genetics. Um, and there you see all the sons also have it in none of the daughters. So uh, this, is, this is a relatively rare condition and also relatively harmless. That's good. Oh, here's the, here's the complicated one. Excellent traits. Oh, oh look at all the rules there. Uh, it's, it's much more common, but also much more complicated. So, what you see here is for rare one, rare alleles, you see many more males than females are affected. This is all generally, also generally the case for common excellent alleles. Think of colorblindness. We all know people who are colorblind. And what you find is that they're mostly males. Very few females. Uh, we also see that father to son inheritance is never observed. Good. Think of how sex inheritance works. Males have an X and a Y. If they pass their Y along, they produce sons. If they pass their X along, it's daughters. So the sons never get the X chromosome from dad. They got the Y chromosome. Among sons of carrier mothers, about half are affected and half are normal. So again, going back to colorblindness. If you've got a brother who is affected with colorblindness, there's about a 50-50 chance that you will also have it. All the daughters from the mating of carriers by normal males will be normal. So the daughters will have normal vision in the case of colorblindness, but half will be carriers. Again, it's invisible. You don't know. And if you have an affected male, somebody who's colorblind, and a normal female, they will have no affected children. Yeah, so you think, well, it's just died out with me. But no, it's because all the daughters will be carriers, every single one of them. 
so you may see it reemerge in your grandchildren. There are a number of known excellent diseases. I just mentioned colorblindness. There is a form of muscular dystrophy, which is another really tragic disease that leads to death and debility. Um, there's one called reticuloendotheliosis, which affects connective tissues. And hemophilia is probably the most famous, aside from colorblindness. And I showed you a pedigree before of this, but I kind of glossed over the fact that it was sex-linked. Uh, this was the British royal family again. And notice, all the affected, the fully affected individuals are males. This is a pedigree of hemophilia, by the way. So only males are expressing it, what you'd expect with this kind of excellent recessive. But there's a number of females that have been identified as healthy carriers of the tree. So again, this is the kind of thing you'd see with an X-linked recessive allele. As you'd see only males showing it, and you'd see this complicated pattern of expression. Okay, here's an example of, you can also have X-linked dominant traits. Look at there, what do you see going on in this? So it's X-linked, so dad here, I have to train this thing better. Um, so dad's got the trait on his X chromosome, and that means that all of his daughters will have it, but none of his sons. Right? And they'll all express it because it's dominant. The daughters, well, they can pass it on to their sons and their daughters. So we'll see that appearing there. And as you can see here, both, so, both affected females and affected males can pass it on. The affected males only to their daughters, affected females to both daughters and sons. Okay, so notice all the daughters and none of the sons of affected males are also affected. Half the sons and daughters of affected females are also affected. Let that sink in. So I will be giving you some problems. I'll give you some pedigrees this weekend. We'll stop there. And I'll just warn you, yes, there will be some homework I'll put together by tomorrow uh, that will be specifically about sex life traits. I will also have, I'll have problems to bring to class on Monday, so we'll do some practice runs through some of them. And then these will probably end up on the exam for next Friday. Any questions? Okay, Thursday lab group. I'll see you tomorrow and we'll start on the next cross.